Herzlich willkommen. Welcome everybody to the first afternoon talk on the second and last day of Roscon 12. It's really my pleasure to introduce uh, Vaishali Taka. Um, she is from India, works for Oracle and also has a hand in the uh, Linux kernel. So she will tell us something in what's up in the land of Linux kernel security. And please give a big hand. Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'll just, so I am Vaishali Thakkar and I work as a Linux kernel engineer at Oracle in the kernel security engineering group. And I am also associated with Rails Girl Summer of Code as a co-organizer and I was also a former intern uh, of Outreach. So if you have any questions about this program, you can meet me in the hallway afterwards. So let's just start with what this talk is about. So uh, the basic idea behind giving this talk is to have an overview of how Linux kernel security has changed over the times and with the advancement of the technology from the Unix dark security stuff to where we have reached at the point and what are the future challenges we, uh, uh, over there and how we can uh, address them. So some of the little bit history about Linux as an OS. So Linux is basically, as we all know, a clone of the Unix operating system and it was written in early 90s. So the core security model of the uh, Unix was a discre discretionary access control DDAC system. And so basically what uh, Unix DAC security model is, we have uh, uh, where DAC allows to restrict the access to objects based on the identity of subjects. So for example, there is a user and they want to create a new file and then they, uh, there, uh, they can decide they, who else can read or write to those files. And this policy is basically implemented as uh, permission bits which are attached uh, to the file's inode system and uh, which may be set by the owner of the file, so the root user itself. And permission for accessing the file, uh, like reading or writing the processes of the file itself, uh, may be set separately for the moment and this can be done for the owner of those files or a group of the people or even uh, anyone. So Unix stack also allows the owner of an object uh, to set the security policies and there is also a concept of a super user which means that an entity which bypasses this Unix stack's policy. So basically uh, running a program with, uh, as a super user means that you have every rights to the system. So there is pro uh, probably nothing which can stop you to access the critical information in the system itself. And this leads us to the problems which we had with the, this kind of system. So it, uh, when the Unix stack was implemented uh, by the Dennis Ritchie and the other people at the labs, the basic idea wasn't to provide a kind of security, but just to have a thin layer of the protection. And it also doesn't protect us with the flawed or the malicious code because of the super user identities. And as the super user, as a super user, one can have all kind of accesses. It also violates the normal user's policy. And one also cannot express kind of modern security requirements of which this kind of model in the, uh, after this technological advancement in the same area. So also user can invoke the system services by switching to the uh, root users uh, like uh, with the set UIDs. And it's basically a nine bits model. So there's a RWX per owner for the group uh, of the people or the other, like everyone. So these are some of the problems which we had with the Unix stack system and that's how the features, uh, security features were added into the Linux. So uh, 
Initially, when people started about uh, started thinking about the security in the Linux operating system, when the users of the Linux operating system grown, uh, the basic idea was just to extend the uh, minimal things from this uh, Unix stack features, and then the things were changed. So some of these. Uh, some of the features which were added initially are just the extensions of the Unix Tux features. So say, uh, first of all, the POSIX ex uh, access control lists were added into the uh, kernel. So the traditional POSIX system uh, allows us to have the classes of users, uh, for example, the single user, and then the group of a user, and then the uh, everyone and then we can have a permissions like a read and write and a person can decide whom they want, uh, what kind of user can have or what kind of uh, rights. For example, if a user want to decide that a certain kind of users can have rights, uh, uh, read accesses and not the right, so that can be uh, added as a secure, uh, that can be added over there and that's how you uh, manage the process access control list. So these are the kind of entry types which were, uh, which in according to the uh, list can be uh, defined over there. So owner is the one who is, uh, who is the user itself and can have a read write and uh, RWX access rights. Named user is the one where the user and the name and then the RWX, uh, so you can have the access rights over there. Also, and uh, ACL consists the list of the entries over there and the permissions of each file system object can have uh, ACL representatives. And these things, uh, access control lists are managed by the setfscl and getfscl uh, commands in the Linux kernel itself. Then the POSIX uh, capabilities were added and uh, it was added as a solution of a problem with the super user. So when a process tries to do a privileged operation, the oper system checks whether the uh, user have a uh, efficient, uh, effective set of the process. Uh, for example, a process tries to set up the clock and the Linux kernel will check if the process has the uh, sys, uh, sys time bit set over there and then only they can uh, access, uh, access the clock. So, it means that when an application requires a limited kind of privileges, uh, it's, uh, they will not have the all kind of privileges and this restricts them to uh, perform the unintended uh, actions over there. Also, a uh, process has three sets of bitmaps called uh, inheritable, permitted, and effective capabilities. So each capability is uh, implemented as a bit and uh, according to these bits, the permissions are defined over there. After that, uh, namespaces were added. So namespaces were derived from the plan, plan 9 operating system, which was a research project, uh, extension of the Unix research project over there. And the partitioning resources uh, can be seen by the process. So how it helps is each process can be launched with its own private temporary directory and invisible to other processes and which works seamlessly with uh, existing application code to eliminate the entire class of the security threats which are over there. So it's not a security feature as per, but it helps with implementing the kind of security features which can be needed. It uh, have been used to help implement a, the multi-level security where files are labeled with the security classifications and potentially entire hidden from the users. 
uh, cryptography API. So cryptography API is, is basically an implementation of the various cryptographic algorithms over there and it's used by many kernel subsystems including the commonly deployed, uh, so basically the uh, commonly deployed ciphers hash functions and limited asymmetric cryptography algorithms are used over there. And the key management subsystem, it's a key management subsystem for managing the cryptography keys within the kernel. So uh, mainly uh, the cryptography API is used by the IPsec code and the disk encryption schemes and the kernel module signature verification schemes. There is also uh, work, some of the kind of work done for supporting the hardware-based cryptographic features. And after that, we have a network security. So Linux is uh, have a capable network security stack for supporting the many uh, features and it can be used both so Linux's uh, network security model can, uh, can be used as an endpoint node or an, on a network or as a router passing the traffic between the uh, interfaces. So kernel le level modules can be hooked into the framework to examine how, uh, how we can uh, examine the packets and how we can add the security features at that level. So uh, the NetFilter project is an IP network layer framework which hooks these packets into the, which hooks packets which passes into through, into and through and from the system. Also uh, IP tables are the, mo is the module, NetFilter module which implements uh, IPv6 v4 firewalling scheme managed by the user userland IP tables and EB tables is for filtering uh, providing the filtering at the link layer there is also uh, ARP tables which provides filtering at ARP packets and IPsec is a network protocol suite which authenticates and encrypts the packets of data sent over the network and it can also be used to implement the VPNs and uh, the point-to-point -point security. So these were some of the things which were uh, added independently but now comes the part of adding the Linux security modules. So the issues uh, which were there with because of the dark systems uh, giving a privileges to the user at, uh, at some extent. Uh, so to come, uh, come over with these uh, limitations, we need to have a system like MAC, mandatory access control system, which uh, can give, uh, which, which a, a developer can add a certain kind of uh, points to uh, have the control over giving a rights to the user or the group of the users. So uh, Linux security module is uh, implements hooks at all security critical points within the kernel and uh, Mac security differs from the dark in the security policy to administer centrally and users do not administer, administer policy for their own so resources. So this helps uh, to contain uh, attacks which exploit the user, lives, user level software bugs and the misconfiguration. So LSM API also allows uh, different security models to be plugged in the kernel. So typically uh, access control frameworks. A uh, user of the framework can uh, register with the API and then can have uh, receive callbacks from those hooks. And it was basically de uh, designed to provide the specific needs of everything needed to successfully implement a uh, Mac system in the Linux kernel. So there are different kind of uh, LSMs uh, included into Linux kernel at the moment and 
the first LSM which was included was a, a, a SC Linux. So, SC Linux is basically an implementation of the, say, fine-grained mandatory access control system, which uh, to meet the, uh, say, wide uh, range of the security requirements which were, which were needed at that time. And like from a general purpose use to the military and the government policies, SE Linux can be used uh, to manage the classical information. So, SE Linux, uh, in SE Linux, all objects on the system are assigned as a security labels and the security relevant information between entities on the system are hooked by LSM and passed to the Linux, SE Linux module, which consults its uh, security policy to determine whether the operation would, should continue or not. Also, uh, the security policy is loaded from user land and it can be modified. Uh, and the SE Linux at the moment is implemented in all the Fedora-based operating system and also, Android security model uses SE Linux with some of their extensions from their side. SMAC. So, the idea behind the authors, uh, author of a uh, SMAC was to have a simple form of MAC security and uh, in response to the relative complexity which are provided by the SE Linux. So it basically works based with the file systems which supports extended attributes and it's a part of Tizen security architecture at the moment. Also, it has gained some popularity in the embedded system stuff and I think uh, one of the IoT system, IoT operating system by Intel is also now using SMAC over there. App Armor, uh, it's a fundamentally different scheme to SE Linux and XMAX because it has no direct labeling and security policies uh, are applied to the path names. It is, uh, uh, at the moment, it is uh, shipped with uh, Ubuntu and OpenSUSE and basically it allows it it allows the system administrators to restrict the program's capabilities and uh, it also features a learning mode where the security behavior of the applica application is observed and converted automatically into the security profile. And Tomoyo is uh, an another Mac system which implements the path-based security. It, it, use, it utilizes the learning mode similar to the App Armor where the behavior of the system is observed to enhance the security policy. And it also records the trees of pros, process invocation described as a domains. So uh, say we uh, have a system and when the system boots from in it as a series of uh, tasks are invoked over there and which lead us to logged into a user runtime on a shell and ultimately executing a command over there, say ping. So this particular chain of tasks is recorded and as a valid domain for the execution of that application and other invocations which have not been uh, recorded are just denied. So there is a tree over there and uh, then the other invocations which are not over there that can be denied. Also, uh, when the protection is enabled, uh, Tomoyo uh, Linux restricts the process uh, to the behaviors and the resources allowed by the administrator. It is more for the end users and uh, as of now, there has not yet been any real world implication or maybe like uh, appreciable adoption of the Tomoyo in the industry. Uh, Yama, it's a collection of the dark security enhancement from the projects like GR security and uh, 
it enhanced the restrictions on, it has an enhanced restrictions on p trace are implemented in Yama. It was just added at the time to have the kind of, say, uh, there was a G GR security had the patches over there and it was just uh, added as a patch and uh, I don't think there has been much improvement in the module after that. Uh, load pin is a fairly new uh, LSM added in, I guess, 4.8 or 4.9, uh, and it ensures that all kernel loaded files are loaded from the trusted device. So, say DM Verity or uh, CD ROM. It uh, so it allows the systems that have a verified and or un uh, unchangeable file system to enforce the modules, uh, say kernel modules or the firmware loading modules to restrictions without needing to sign the individual files. Uh, audit subsystem, uh, so it was first designed to meet the government certification requirements but was later adopted by many uh, Linux security modules over there and other security components are also using it now. Uh, it, uh, edit logs, uh, audit logs are usually uh, useful to track the uh, security related information or the system's behavior and uh, to detect help, uh, to detect that uh, what kind of uh, stuff were going on when the things went wrong. So, then we have a sec comp, so it was added as a mechanism which restricts the access to the system calls uh, by processes. So the problem with the system call API is that it's a wide area, so it opens the wide area for the wide area for the attacks as well, and like any other system, we also have bugs in the uh, uh, say a system call APIs. So the privileged nature of the kernel also can also allow the bugs via system call API. So to reduce the attack surface of the kernel by preventing applications from entering the system calls which are not needed uh, can help to avoid those attacks. Uh, avoid those attacks. Uh, one of the prominent software solution using the SecComp can be a uh, Docker. So Docker uses SecComp and as a primary feature, and it has uh, sub commands over there which can be implemented. Uh, original SecCom code uh, was also known as uh, mode one, which uh, provided access to only four system calls, which are the basic four system calls, uh, read, write, exit, and signal return. And then there was an extension of the SecCom uh, then by basically for the Google's uh, Google Chrome project. It's a SecCom BPF and it's an arbitrary specification of uh, which system calls are permitted for a process and integration with the audit logging. So, also it's a configuration policy of the SecComp BPF is implemented with the Berkeley packet uh, filter rules, which helps with the, uh, say, extending some kind of security levels uh, which are provided by the SecCom. And then we have an integrity management subsystem. So it's used to maintain the integrity of files uh, of the system and Integrity measurement architecture component, IMA performs uh, runtime integrity measurement of files using the cryptographic hashes and comparing them with the valid hashes over there. Also, uh, measurement performed by IMA may be logged with the audit system and uh, 
also can be used as a remote attached station. Also, uh, DM Verity module, so it's intended to use as a part of the veri verified boot process and where an appropriately authorized caller brings a device online and then a trusted partition containing a kernel modules to be loaded, to be loaded later. So it's basically a device mapper target which manages file integrity at the block level. But after adding this many subsystems separately or say uh, on the top of the kernel, some of the modules which went inside the kernels, is this level of security sufficient? And uh, why it's not sufficient? Because uh, when this days uh, Linux being an operating system of a server or a desktop has transferred in uh, being an operating system, a mobile operating system, now even IoT devices are using it. And when the operating system, ha this operating system has become a part of our day-to-day -day life, there is, a, uh, it has also increased the chances of the attacks over there. So the Google, uh, in the last three years, uh, Google's Android uh, security bug bounty program has shown the kind of attacks which can be done at the kernel level easily and the kernel should be able to protect itself. So this leads us to think about the possible solutions over there. So one of the possible solutions can be have a research, or more research on this area and have the tools which, uh, which can find the bugs and detect them. So I'll just talk about some of the tools and then why even tools are not the, say, uh, perfect solution over there. So uh, at the moment in the kernel, there are a wide range of uh, static and dynamic analysis tools which are used and for uh, since in last 10 years, the uh, research projects have grown, the university students or the PhD uh, people have shown the interest in, uh, find, uh, in doing a more detailed research on the particular bug classes. It's all, but it's only useful when it's regularly uh, detect, uh, the bugs are regularly detected and to detect the bugs regularly, we need to run the tools regularly. So either you can also automate the system or you can have uh, maybe a person sitting over there to just run the tool over there. But that's not the solution over here. So it has, also it has the limitations of the, uh, when we talk about the static analysis tools, we also have a limitations of the false positives and uh, this also needs to be documented and because when the, uh, maybe a person who has developed the tool knows that uh, what kind of false positive are given for uh, by case by case basis, but probably a person who is just new to the tool and just running it over the code may not know that uh, the, this case has the, this kind of false positives given by the particular tool. So it's somehow hard to also uh, get the exit bugs and probably it can end up uh, having a chaos over there. So uh, some of the to tools which are widely used in the uh, Linux kernel at the moment. Uh, so first is a SPARSH, which was uh, written by Linus Torvalds and uh, then was uh, maintained by Josh. Uh, it provides a set of annotations designed to convey the semantic information about the types. Uh, so initially it was uh, help, it was helping to detect the Indian related bugs, but uh, then it also extend, uh, the features were also extended to give a warnings about unsupported operations or the type mismatches with the restriction, uh, restricted integer types. 
It also warns about any non-static variable or a function definition that has no declaration. And there are, say, more than 6,000 patches submitted uh, which where, uh, the, where the bugs were detected using SPAS. Uh, SMH, so SMH is uh, written by Dan Carpenter and it gives you a kind of issue, it tackles the issues which are like null pointer dereference, error pointer dereference and uh, uninitialized data, some kind of information leaks, but it also have uh, higher chances of uh, false positives say 30 to 40 percent, so it's not, uh, uh, so the tool it's, uh, to uh, have the automated uh, system, the tool itself is not added in the Linux kernel, but it is widely used by the DEN and some other developers uh, time to time to solve the, to detect the issues. Also, DEN tries to uh, run this tool or over the uh, new patches which are submitted into the Linux kernel. And uh, it, uh, also there's a zero day uh, testing robot in the Linux kernel. Uh, th and the idea of zero day testing robot is say, uh, give the build, uh, it, so zero day, what zero day testing robot does is, it, when the, every patch is submitted into the uh, Linux kernel subsystem uh, mailing lists, it picks a patch uh, over there, uh, from there and it runs it on the 20 to 25 other architectures and then gives the build system errors and directly submits the uh, result to the uh, submitter of a patch. So uh, with this, uh, it also uh, it also runs some of the scripts which are uh, uh, coccinal scripts or the SMIT scripts which helps to give this uh, bugs, uh, which reports this bugs directly over there uh, before it's been added into the mainline kernel. So both of these tools are used by zero day testing robot, not all of the scripts. Uh, so the scripts which have ch more chances to have the uh, false positives are not preferred to uh, add into the zero day testing robot, but some of the scripts which has, say, high level of uh, trust uh, from the uh, author of the script and the developers based on the results given by the script can be added into, into the system. Uh, so Coxinel is also a uh, other uh, pattern matching and transformation tool. Uh, there are few scripts which are already added into the kernel itself and like I said, zero day testing robot also runs some of these scripts separately. Uh, it has its, uh, so it's not, it not only detects the bug, but it also fixes the bug. So the script can be, uh, this, uh, the tool itself have a language called semantic patch language and how we write the script is in the git patch form. So you can remove the line you, and you can add the lines based on the pattern of the bug. So when you run those scripts, you not only uh, gives the, uh, the script not only gives you the warnings, but it also just fixes the code by itself. So uh, this is also one of the uh, advantage of this tool. It handles few security issues like uh, null pointer dereference and use of sleeping functions under locks, use of the free, a few other locking related bugs like uh, double locks or the missing of uh, unlock, etc. Uh, another uh, widely used tool is obviously the compiler itself, uh, but GCC also have some advancement since la last two, three versions and uh, there are many other sec new security warnings, security related warnings are added. So uh, GCC also, uh, GCC plugins helps with the handling the specific kind of bugs when you don't want to add the code into the compiler itself. So say you have a bug class and you want to solve the particular type of bugs, then you can uh, use the GCC plugin API and write a plugin 
and then it can detect the uh, bugs over there based on the uh, plugin return. So as of now, there are five GCC plugins added into the Linux kernel, and uh, so basically, the, uh, first the uh, not all of them are security related. The one which was, which say we, uh, we have also cyclomatic complexity, which helps you to just uh, at the age of having uh, at age of. Uh, detecting some kind of security issues, but it's not a kind of a GCC plugin which just gives you a result about the, uh, to handle a certain kind of bug classes. But then also there is uh, plugins like uh, randomizing structures, uh, layout at the compile time, or maybe like detecting any structures that contain a user attributes and make sure that it is being fully initialized. There is also a structure leak plugin, which is and all plugin written over here. Uh, we have all of this plugin uh, were actually initially written or maybe as a part was as a part of GR security, and there uh, they are mainly written by MEC RevP, and they, the project was actually funded by the CII at that time. Uh, also, we have uh, three or maybe a two uh, widely used uh, fuzzers in the Linux kernel. So Trinity was developed by Dave Jones, and it helps with uh, mainly giving a oops. Over there, there are many CVEs, uh, as uh, we can say, as a proof that these uh, that uh, this kind of Things where uh, oops were uh, can so so actually the, when the the tool was developed, uh, it was developed based on that uh, some of the CV I mean by him to to, to make uh, things more reliable and it, it it also detects the locking related bugs and memory leaks etc. Uh, Cscaler, it, it's it's developed recently, like three or four years ago, and it's developed by Dimitri and the team at Google. Uh, it also helps with the resource and memory information leaks. Uh, there is also a list uh, on the projects wiki that what kind of CVEs are handled by the uh, the tool or the detected by the tool. And they also helps in handling the deadlocks. Uh, there are some advancement in the American Fuzzy Loop, which was uh, initially, which uh, which was a successful project at the user level. And in the last year, in the last two years, there is a proof that it can be user, it can be used successfully at the kernel level as well. And also, there are address sanitizers and thread sanitizers, etc., to help us with the particular kind of bugs, like data races. But then again, uh, is fixing bugs sufficient? Because if we need to fix the bug, or we need to fix the individual bugs, then I don't think that is uh, something uh, like a secure, at security level. Because because the code is changing and every day there are hundreds of lines committed into the kernel itself. Also, it's important that when an individual bug is fixed, it is fixed into the latest uh, kernel. So it's also important to understand that this fix should be uh, go uh, should be added into the stable kernel and the device manufacturers are adding or maybe updating their uh, code over there also if they are if, if they are updating the code are they going the, uh, are the updates going to the users itself and say you have a mobile which you have purchased uh, from a device manufacturer 5 years ago and there are many security thing, uh, bugs which are which are uh, which were there at the time when the when your device manufacturer added that kernel, but then 
when you get the updates, it, the, the new updates comes to you after a one year or two years, and then it gives the attacker a window because they already know that this bug is fixed. This bug is fixed into the new kernel, but it's not fixed in your phone system. So it's also important that the now when we are in the IO, so with the mobiles, the, the thing is probably you will change it after say five or six years. But when we are in the IoT space, and say we have a door, door lock system or the alarm system at the door, we are not going to change it for, uh, maybe we are developers, so maybe we are going to do that, but what about the normal user? They are, they are just purchasing, they have just fixed it over there in their system, and it will stay over there for 10 years. And maybe a person knows that, what kind of things are used in, the, in that system, but the user itself doesn't. So uh, fixing bugs is not sufficient as of now, and we need a system where a kernel should be able to help itself with the security stuff. So this leads us to the next project, which is currently going on into the Linux kernel, and it's a... Uh, Kernel self-protection project. So, so the basic idea behind the kernel self-protection project was to have uh, to that the kernel should be able to protect itself, and bugs have longer lifetimes. Uh, it, it uh, as of now, the current focus uh, in this project is to upstream the GR security and parks features, and uh, also. Here, uh, whatever work is, uh, is going on, we are trying to kill the bug classes and not the individual bugs. So uh, you can also see uh, Case, Cook's, Case Cook's blog, and he has actually written the, he writes the uh, blog for each of the new kernel. So uh, what kind of features from the kernel self-protection pro projects are added over there can be uh, seen. Seen. And yes, in the conclusion, uh, we have come far from the unique security, unique dark security to a kernel self protection project, maybe. But there is always a scope of the research because there are bug class with the advancement of the technologies, the advancement of the bug classes are increased as well. And uh, Security, it has been said in this conference many times, but maybe we can say one, it, one more time that security is no longer a buzz, but buzzword, but maybe a necessity. So, uh, and I would like to see uh, more work at the kernel level. As I, as I said, there are many CVEs which can, uh, we have our pages say 10 pages for the, in the first two months with the CVEs which can be handled and we can have the next features in the Linux kernel. So yes, and there are resources which uh, you can just check regarding the separate projects. I also have the slides uh, which, uh, of my talk which I gave on the, which has the, all of the tools uh, the introduction of the tools and how those tools works and what uh, which tool is uh, particularly useful for which kind of bug classes. So you can just go for that. And yes, Linux Security Summit videos are good too. Thanks. Yeah, um, questions please. I, as questions might be a bit more complicated, Carsten pro, uh, proposed, and I will walk around and hand over the microphone then. So, questions please. Ah, Carsten, already the first one. Ah, I'm jumping. You mentioned a GCC, pl a GCC plugin to randomize the layout of structures. Um, so an attacker doesn't know the layout in memory. Um, 
how is that applied? Because I can imagine uh, that you cannot reasonably randomize all structures in the kernel. Yeah. You have to pass structures to user space. Uh, sometimes structures represent hardware layouts. Do you have to tag structures to be randomized, or how does that work? Sorry? Um, do you have to tag each individual structure so that the plugin randomizes it, or how does the compiler know which structure it can safely randomize and which must be kept as is, for example, because it is passed to user space? I'm not sure to understand the question actually. So, so you are you are asking that uh, uh, how a plugin picks the particular structure? That's what you are asking. Yes, um, I I guess that it is not safe to randomize all structures used hmm. by the kernel. So that some of the structures must be kept in their normal form. How does the plugin know which structures can be randomized and which cannot? Oh, Do they get tagged? Yeah. Is, the, is there a label on them? How does that work? Ah, there's. Yeah, yeah, let, let me come over. We have more kernel experts here than I would have ever imagined. It's great. No, I'm not really an expert, but I have looked into the GR security patch, and it's uh, almost the same idea, I think. Hopefully, it is. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's tagged by a keyword. A macro expands to nothing if the plugin is not present. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is inside of the tool, right, that you mentioned. So yes. yeah, yeah. So, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, 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 so shall we write a memo of this and send it to the, to the developer so that he knows about the merge conflicts and stuff, so maybe he takes care of it. So. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, okay. More questions? Okay. If this is not the, yeah. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Let me just go ahead. Um, I think many problems, uh, security-related problems, uh, partly addressed by GR security, are a result of the memory model the kernel is using. This means uh, you know from academic research some things like microkernels or even nanokernels or other like, and I think the main idea behind them is having even in kernel space separate address spaces, virtual address spaces, separating concerns or isolating, isolating is the correct uh, ter term yeah. here, uh, isolating for example that device drivers from each other or from the file system code and so on. And I think um, there was a very old uh, discussion between Andrew Tannenbaum and the other people about this, uh, it's, it's not a new question. But do you know of any ideas of, of at least using some of those concepts in the kernel? Uh, not at the moment, I guess. No, I think this is the, just the basic problem. The, the biggest class of the classes you have mentioned. Yes. It's just the memory model as such. This big one, big single address space. Um. I'm absolutely not an expert in this. I would guess this would boil down to something like sandboxing in the kernel space, right? So, I mean, first only in the address space and then also execution, blah, blah, blah. But um, it's, it's basically something like you have in user land or in, in, in iOS or at, uh, Android, so with sandboxing and you would, yeah, and you would, you would then transform this in, in the kernel. What's about um, performance uh, issues then? Yeah, yeah, so, okay. Yeah, so I mean, uh, if, if we need to ad, uh, advance any, anything in the kernel, then we also need to ensure that nothing should be break uh, which, uh, on the systems um, which are running. In my yeah. opinion, uh, performance problem need, uh, for example, you can just enable it for testing and for finding bugs or for finding problems. And in some production kernels where this, uh, performance is more important than security, you can disable it. And if you have a very, uh, very security-aware systems where performance does not matter that much, you will enable it for production kernels this way. 
just, just as an idea. So it need not be a general feature. Yeah, that's the idea that uh, performance should not be compromised on the uh, law. Uh, sorry, yeah, performance should not be when you want to add the security stuff. So, and that's how it took a time for the people to adapt the parks or GR security stuff and to, you know, get used with the idea that the security is important and it should be in the main line itself as well. The well, no question, rather common. The, the issue with the address space separation fails when you get to DMA. Uh, then, and that is the common case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you would need to have really separate address spaces for direct memory access, sure, which is a very important performance feature. Um, well, I think there's a partly solution. You are right, the problem is existing, but a part, sol a part solution could be, for example, DMA is typically used in device drivers and low-level drivers only, and you hand over, like similar to mailboxing, but you're, in reality you are just uh, handing over the access rights to some pages uh, to other parts of the kernel, for example, between the driver and uh, the file systems at some appropriate places. So of course it's, compl it's a complicated system and it's, uh, it's no real good solution, uh, yeah. but uh, it could help in determining some of the problems or alleviating some of them. Another question over there. Um, I have a question um, on, on the uh, firmware uh, files that I sometimes have to download uh, <laughs> for the kernel. Um, are there any, any checks on these uh, firmware files especially or are they just provided uh, by, the, by the vendor of, of the hardware? Yeah, it's provided by the hardware as far as I know. Yeah. So... Uh, so the uh, thing which I over oh, here. Yeah. So I think at some point integrity measurement system helps over there, but I don't think the uh, actual implementation at say uh, for all kind of checks are done at the kernel level. What are you distrusting? Is uh, do you distrust the hardware vendor, the processor vendor? If you do, then you shouldn't buy that that processor anyway, because if the processor itself has some hidden features you don't know about, you have no chance. Whether it's in firmware or not does not matter. If there is any hidden functionality you don't know, undocumented functionality, for, for example, can. Um, for example, the, the, the supervisor mode, the bypass the supervisor mode, is only one bit in the processor telling whether you are working in ring zero or not. If this is compromised in some way, you are off anyway. You know of this dirty cow bug, for example, last autumn. It's a kernel bug which leads to, you can write to any arbitrary page, any arbitrary, even if it's right protected or not belonging to you. So th these kind of bugs are so generic, and uh, so, so uh, this class of bugs is, is, is really an important problem, and it has to be solved somehow, but it's uh, not possible without trusting the hardware vendors, I think. And there are some bugs at this, in this area, known bugs, which have been fixed in the past. And the unknown bugs, of course, is, is the next problem. But if you really want to have security, then use your Commodore 64 again. I think, yes. So it has 1,200 uh, transistors, and you can check them all by hand. <laughs> but I think there will be a lot of discussion after this talk as well. There was a question <laughs> over there. I think we got a special interest group in kernel security here just building up. Um, so, hello, and thanks for your talk. Um, all the time people here think about desktop systems and servers mainly. 
But uh, during the last years, we are talking about or seeing uh, many embedded systems without any control, entering networks, being delivered with a safe state of kernel and distribution, and then changed or being in an unsafe environment and, and completely run over by an update with the different features. Just imagine your Sony is watching you from the firmware with the next update and streaming live to Facebook with a cam of your smart TV that you, that you own yourself. It's an embedded system that you don't have a control over. You have to trust the, the manufacturer and you don't have any instance of control about changing the routines and the functionality of it. Imagine your set receiver. It has a 100 megabit connect to your local network. Your DAB radio, your smartphone, Every update you have to trust and you don't have verification processes for the kernel and for the first safe state when you bought it. And everything which is coming after it, which you hopefully have security issues uh, fixed in there, might be also a negative surprise. And I don't see any systematic uh, protection against those uh, dangers. Thank you. Probably less of a question, but more of a concern, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, but uh, this is then, to me, from my understanding, I'm correct me if I'm wrong, this is on a high level. I mean, this is when, when somebody puts in something malicious and, um, yeah, and, and puts in some spyware on those devices, for instance, or that get hacked. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Get hacked. But. Is, do you see any, any possibilities to, f to, to um, rectify this problem on the kernel level? So are there concepts? I'm, I'm not aware of them. It should be. <laughs> yeah, OK, I get the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if we will solve it. Please go ahead if, if you have some comment to that. Yes. So, I mean, uh, as a mainline community, you can't force the device manufacturers to just have these things, but as a users, you can. So it's uh, maybe uh, because you are the one you, who, are, who are using those products and probably yes, companies should take these things, but, and that's how the kernel self-protection is working on as well, because then if you have these features lying over there uh, where the kernel itself is able to uh, maybe uh, prevent attacks, then the possibility of the attacks can be reduced. So, yeah. yeah. A lot of questions and discussion still to do, but we're running out of time. <laughs> thank you, Carsten, exactly. So thank you very much, and thank you coming that long way. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.